Well, good morning and welcome to worship today. It is good to be with you in the house of the Lord. My name is Missy Jensen, and I'm one of the pastors here, along with Pastor Ryan Jensen. We'll be leading you in worship today, and we want to ask you to keep Pastor Stephen in your prayers. He was supposed to be having fun today on vacation, but he came down with COVID, uh, so we're hoping the best for him, and we'll let him make up his vacation time another time, right? We do want to encourage everybody to take a moment to fill out the card that is in your bulletin. You can share your contact information with us as well as any prayer concerns that you might have. And then on the back side, you can check any area uh, of the church that you are interested in getting more information about or connected to a group. We would love to follow up with you. And for our friends that are joining us online, we say welcome to you as well and encourage you to chat with one another um, and, and engage with one another in that way. But let's stand now and greet one another, and then we'll join together in our call to worship. I invite you to remain standing as we join together in our call to worship. Gathered as God's people, we come to worship together, singing praises to the one who loves us, opening our hearts to the one who calls us. Called to be followers of Jesus, we come to share our lives together, to celebrate the joys of our hearts to mingle our tears with God's, challenged to become partners with the Spirit, we will seek peace and hope. Now let's join our voices in singing, Be Thou My Vision. The words are on the screen, or you can turn in your hymnals to page 451. be seated. I invite us now into a time of prayer, uh, sharing the joys and concerns on our hearts this morning. So let us pray. Holy God, your wonders fill the sky, the sea, and the ground beneath our feet. Your creation is beautiful and it's full of inspiration. As we look around us, how could we not see glimpses of our Creator? of the hands that so carefully crafted all things. And how could we not be drawn to you, desiring to know you more? You have revealed your existence to us from the very beginning, and your grace has never failed to meet us where we are. 
So thank you, God, for the great depths of your love. But God, in the midst of our amazement, our eyes can't help but to be drawn to the corrupted parts of the world, those that have become distorted from the goodness in which you made them. Violence, neglect, <coughs> greed, and apathy <coughs> keep us from loving, oh, excuse me, <coughs> loving our neighbors. And substance abuse, mental health issues, and insecurities keep us from loving ourselves too. Help us to rediscover balance in our lives and for compassion and empathy to overcome our selfishness. Help us to treat ourselves, each other, and the world around us with the same care and concern that you show us so that we can recognize the value you have worked into all aspects of your creation. Help us to love as we have been loved. Oh God, hear these prayers and know the needs of the people and situations that are on our hearts this morning. And with those, we also lift up Gloria Buchanan, Carrie DeYoung, Bob Batch, David Sheets, Corby Barho, Priscilla Fierbacher, Margaret Jones, Jane, Ray, Trace and his parents, victims of violence, those still recovering from the Maui wildfires, and those who were caught in the path of Hurricane Adalia. Let your healing and grace cover your people. Help each of us to know the assurance of your presence and let your peace still the disquiet in our souls. We ask these things with the words that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right, kids. Well, it is children's time, so I want to invite y'all forward, and Pastor Missy is going to have a special word for y'all today. Good morning. Are you alive? Good morning. Anybody? Thank you. Good morning. It's so good to see you. Well, today in scripture, during, during our time in worship, we're going to learn about a guy named Moses. Have y'all heard of Moses before? Some yeses, some noes. So he's, he's a pretty big deal. Okay. So he's pretty famous for helping lead God's people out of Egypt, right? He delivered them from slavery, led them through the Red Sea, and they walked on dry ground, and then they were wandering in the wilderness, and he was leading them the whole time. So he did some great things, but did you know that before he did all that, he didn't want to? And he made some excuses as to why he couldn't follow through with what God was asking him to do. Do you ever make excuses to get out of doing stuff you don't want to do? What are some excuses? Do you ever say I'm too busy playing my video game? Oh, uh -huh. yeah, you blame your brother. Elliot hasn't done it yet. I don't have to do it. I like that tactic. Um, have any of you said, I'm too young, I can't do that. Or, I'm not brave enough, I can't do that. Right? If your parents asked you to make lunch after church, could you do it? What excuse would you give? Okay, grilled cheese, you're on. Anything else? 
No. I like it. Yeah. Right, we have excuses, because sometimes we don't feel like we know what we're doing, right? But that's where Moses was at when he first meets God. And he says, God, I can't be a leader. People don't even like me. Why would they listen to me? And then he said, I can't even speak that well. You want me to talk to all of these people? I can't talk to them. That makes me too nervous. And then he got an idea and he said, hey, have you met my brother Aaron? He's a good guy. He would be great at this job. Have you ever tried to throw your sibling under the bus? <laughs> yeah. So <clears throat> God answered all those excuses by telling Moses, don't worry. I will be with you. And with those words, God made it possible for Moses to step out in faith and trust that he could do those amazing things for God. And so we've got to remember, too, that when we are asked to do some hard things, that God promises to be with us and makes us able to do them. All right, so let's pray together, and you can repeat after me. Good morning, God. Thank you for this day. And thank you for the story of Moses. Help us to remember that you are always with us. And you make all things possible. We love you, God. Amen. All right, you can go back to your seats. Thanks. Well, learning is a lifelong process. There's always something more to know, and sometimes what we know changes over time as our experiences and perspectives change. And the same is true when it comes to our faith. Who we are now is likely different than who we were 5, 10, or even 20 years ago. And as we change, well, our faith can change too. Discipleship is a journey that continues, and what we learn today can either build off of what we already know, or it can completely reshape our understanding. But either way, it's important to make space for spiritual formation to happen. And today, Ken Lawson, I want to go ahead and invite you up, Ken, is going to share with us the role spiritual formation is playing in his life and about its impact on his faith. Good morning. I'm Ken Lawson. My wife, Rachel, and I have been worship worshiping at Oak Hill United Methodist since 1992. Pastor Missy asked me to speak on how being a part of spiritual formation has had an impact on my faith and my life. Spiritual formation focuses on deepening our relationship with God. It can occur in many ways through prayer, worship, scripture study, receiving Holy Communion, service, and other ways. And I would like to talk about two small groups that have been very important to my spiritual formation. The first is the Coffee Crew Sunday School class led by Pastor Stephen, which meets in the coffee bar, bar outside of Fellowship Hall. Uh, and just so there's no misunderstanding, drinking coffee isn't a requirement to participate in the Sunday School. I'm not a coffee drinker, but they let me stay anyway. I've been participating in this class since January of this year. The discussion topics range or generally follow the day's scripture and message. We explore the scripture and the pastor's message to gain deeper understanding of the context and meaning of the scripture and the messages that we can take away and apply in our daily lives as we work to strengthen our relationship with God. Our discussion is open and honest and we are encouraged to make comments and ask questions. Everyone is very accepting respectful of others' perspectives, and supportive of each other. Through this class and our discussions, I've learned so much more than I would have independently, and I've gotten to know a great group of people. It's been a wonderful experience. There are seven, currently seven adult Sunday school classes, and although they cover different topics, they all offer opportunities to grow in your faith and strengthen your relationship with God. 
Information about the classes is listed in the Cornerstone newsletter. And if you're not already in a Sunday School class, I encourage you to talk with others to learn about the classes and find one that is a good fit for you. The second small group is my Walk to Emmaus reunion group. Reunion groups are open to those who have been on a walk to Emmaus, and I know that many of you are in reunion groups. If you haven't attended a walk, I urge you to consider it. It's like a jump start for spiritual growth. I've been a part of my group since I attended my walk in 1999. Our group typically meets weekly and we discuss our spiritual study, how God has been working in our lives, how we have served God, and where we have fallen short. We ask for, for and offer our prayers. It's a time of sharing, support, and affirmation. I always feel spiritually uplifted after our meetings. If you haven't attended a walk to Emmaus, I encourage you to talk with someone who has to get more information. If you have attended a walk and are not in a reunion group, I encourage you to join one. Diane Merwath is our Walk to Emmaus coordinator, and I know she'll be happy to provide information about the walk and reunion groups. Small groups are such an important part of our church ministry. They are so important to strengthening our connection with the church community. You will be blessed, and you will bless others through your participation. Thank you. Well, God uses all kinds of things to help us grow in our faith. Small group studies, service opportunities, relationships, and even our everyday experiences. But when we intentionally make space for God, the growth that we can experience in our faith is that much greater. So find a class, a small group, or a service opportunity that's going to stretch you a bit and let the learning journey continue. In the meantime, let's give thanks to God for what God is already doing in our lives. And as we do, we invite you to make an offering back to God in recognition and appreciation of the blessings that we have already received. And you can do so by texting the number on the screen or visiting the giving page on our church website or placing an offering in one of the baskets as our ushers pass those in just a moment. And as the baskets are passed, just a reminder, go ahead and stick your registration cards in as well. Let us pray a blessing over the gifts that we bring. Gracious God, you have poured your blessings and love over us every day of our lives. There has never been a time when you were far from us, even when we felt far from you. We give thanks for your unfailing presence and for your unwarranted grace. And may these gifts that we bring to you today be a sign of our love for you as they are used to offer blessings to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Old Moses Way back there in the wilderness Saw some smoke came to the bush, and the bush was burning. God said, Take off your shoes, Moses. You're on holy ground. Moses, I've chosen you to be my man, Moses. Way down in Egypt's land Moses, I've chosen you to work for me Moses, I've chosen you to set my people free Not me, Lord Don't you know I can't talk so good I stutter all the time Do you know my brother, Aaron? He can sing like an angel, talk like a preacher. Not me, Lord. I can't talk so good. And another thing, how will they know that I've been here with you? To do 
Don't you know in Egypt they want little Moses' head? Don't you know in Egypt they want little Moses dead? Don't you know they'll never hear a single word I'll say? Maybe you'd better get your dirty work done another way. Not me, Lord. Please? What's that in your hand, Moses? It's just a rod. Throw it down, Moses. Do you mean like on the ground? Yes, I said throw it down, Moses. Lord, don't take my rod away from me. Don't you know it's my only security? Don't you know when you live here all alone, a man's got to have something he can call his own, not me, Lord. Throw it down, Moses. But Lord, I throw it down, Moses. But, but, throw it down, Moses. Moses threw the rod on the ground, and the rod became a hissing snake. Moses started running, I bet you you'd run, I know I'd run. He was a running from a hot rod, running from a hissing snake. Running scared of what God's gonna do, running scared he'd get a hold of you. And the Lord said, stop. Pick it up, Moses, by the tail. Lord, you have not lived here very long. Lord, you got the whole thing wrong. Don't you know that you never pick up a hissing snake by its pick it up, Moses? It's a rod again, it's a rod again, it's a rod again. Do you know what it means, Moses? know what I'm trying to say, Moses. The rod of Moses became the rod of God. With the rod of God, Strike the rock and the waters will come. With the rod of God, part the waters of the sea. With the rod of God, you can strike. With the rod of God, you can set my people free. What do you hold in your hand today? To what or to who? Are you willing to give it to God right now? Give it up.
up Let it go Throw it down read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our scripture today is from Exodus chapter 3, verse 1 through 15. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Mount Horeb the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing. Yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivitites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. Now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, if I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. 
He said further, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, thus you shall say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this my title for all generations. This is the word of God. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Loving God, we are so grateful that we can gather together to find ourselves on this holy ground, hearing you speak to us yet again. So God, capture our attention as you did with Moses. Speak directly to our hearts and lead us into a new life with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Labor Day is tomorrow, and believe it or not, it is not just a day off to barbecue and wrap up the summer. So we're going to have just a little history lesson today. When the Industrial Revolution swept across the globe and manufacturing became more efficient, companies were then driven by making the most products in the shortest amount of time for the cheapest cost. And consequently, in America at least, most people worked 12 hours a day, seven days a week, with abysmal pay and unsafe environments. All these conditions led to a labor movement by the 1860s, and unions began to form so that they could gain critical mass and a collective voice to call for reform. It was in 1882 that the Central Labor Union in New York wanted to make a large and loud statement, gathering workers from all different vocations to celebrate what they had built together and accomplished for society together on the first Monday of September. And not surprisingly, they didn't find any employers who were willing to shut down their businesses so the employees could participate in their day. So they called for a strike. The workers would gather together and march in a parade from City Hall to Union Square, followed by festivities in Elm Park with a picnic and rallying speeches. As the following years passed, Many other states in the United States replicated this practice. And finally, 12 years later, in 1894, Congress passed an act making Labor Day a national holiday. Now, this was just a drop in the bucket. Because <laughs> as we know, it has taken decades of relentless advocacy to make proper, legally enforced change. For example, it wasn't until 1916 that workers who were injured on the job or became ill because of their job received compensation. It wasn't until 1938 that FDR signed the Fair Labor Standards Act. And in that act, they set the minimum wage, they set a 40-hour maximum work week and a minimum working age of 16. Then the Equal Pay Act came into law in 1963, supposedly <laughs> guaranteeing that pay could not be based on gender. And then one year later, the Civil Rights Act made it illegal for employers to discriminate based on race, color, sex, creed, or national origin. I'll stop the timeline there. 
But you know that this work did not stop in 1964, but it persists today. The powerful continue to oppress. The people continue to cry out about injustices, and we go on lifting the cause of laborers to advocate for their dignity. And guess what, friends? <laughs> The mistreatment of these workers didn't begin with the Industrial Revolution, right? It appears to be a constant part of our human history. And we even have a case example before us in today's scriptures. As this part of the story of God's people opens, we learn that they have come to the land of Egypt during a great famine in Canaan, seeking refuge and grain. Their fellow Israelite named Joseph had risen through the ranks and was high in the courts of Pharaoh. So when his people came, they were welcomed at the time. Of course, eventually, Joseph dies, Pharaoh dies, and along with that, the friendly relationship between the two people groups also dies. A new Pharaoh comes along, and he's intimidated by the sheer number of Israelites. Fearing that they would overtake the nation, he orders the citizens to deal harshly with the Israelites in the workplace, and ultimately initiates a genocide against them at the birth of any Israelite boy. So in Exodus 2, that chapter ends with these words. After a long time, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned under their slavery and they cried out. Their cry for help rose to God from their slavery. God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So then we turn the page to hear this story of Moses encountering God through the most unusual scene. Mysteriously, there's a bush of flame, and yet it is not being consumed. So Moses decides he has to check it out and see what is happening. As he draws near, God is pleased that God has caught Moses' attention. He calls Moses by name, and then he introduces God's self. Now, from our place in history, we might assume that an introduction would not be necessary. <laughs> but we have to remember that Moses was born into a Hebrew family, but was then adopted by the Egyptian royal household and was raised there. And then now, as an adult, he has run, run away to the land of Midian after he murdered an Egyptian slave master in defense of a Hebrew man that he was beating. So now, Moses doesn't feel like he belongs to either group, but God knows exactly where Moses belongs, and he knows exactly to whom Moses belongs as well. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then the Lord continues, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt, I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, although this is Moses' first interaction with God, he learns right away who his God is. This is the God who sees, the one who hears, the one who knows, the one who comes, and the one who leads to a new life. 
Well, let's be honest. Things had not been going well for the Israelites for generations by the time we get to this scene. Upon their arrival in Egypt, life was good. Their security was restored, relationships were healed, families were fed. It was an answer to prayer, but it didn't last. (laughs) Because now their security has turned back to scarcity as they didn't even have enough supplies to meet the demands of their masters. Their relationships are broken by mistrust and greed. And families? What families? (laughs) Their children were being slain. They cried out, wondering where their God was now. Have you ever had a time in life when you felt that way? (laughs) Where we as a people seemed to be on the right track and then... Nothing seems to go right. Like we have this great term in our culture, the American dream, right? Because this is the place where there's promise and potential for everybody to pursue their goals. But now it seems like we keep waking up in a nightmare where it's hard just to make ends meet. And we're trying to just survive, forget about a dream. Like, we thought we made so much progress with racial reconciliation. I mean, we did that whole civil acts right. Civil rights act, excuse me. But now we're learning that we have so much more work to do. And everything we've done so far is good, but it is nowhere near enough. I don't know about you, but in our household, we have adopted recycling. And some of you even do that stinky composting stuff, right? And that was supposed to be great for the environment, but here we are in Austin living through the hottest summer in its recorded history. Why did I put my soda can in that different basket? What is happening? We may find ourselves crying out, wondering where our God is now. And in these moments, this is when we cling to the stories that tell us who our God is. And we hold on to the promise. Our God sees Our God hears, our God knows, our God comes, our God leads us to new life. Now Moses' call narrative reminds us that God knows us intimately. Not just the good parts, but the parts that we try to hide away. And still, God pursues us in order to free us. So after introducing God's self to Moses, then God turns to introduce Moses to a new self that he could have never imagined. He was going to be the one to deliver God's people from Egypt. Now Moses used all kinds of excuses that others had used to define him, hoping and praying that These labels would get him out of the work that God was calling him to. But God definitively responded, I will be with you. In other words, God reminds him, truly, it's not you, (laughs) it's me. God's not interested in those limits and labels that we put on ourselves and invites us to unshackle ourselves as we trust in the God who sees us as we truly are. And freeing us as individuals from our own constraints, then we are called to go and unbound others. In Exodus, God raises up the union leader in Moses to lead God's people into a new future. 
Thankfully, we have witnessed God lifting up more leaders to answer the cries of the oppressed throughout our history. The founder of the Methodist movement, John Wesley, considered social holiness and justice work to be essential tenets of our faith. He lived this out by not conforming to the standards the Church of England had set for their ministers at the time, to maintain their social status and to stay in good standing with the royal family. Instead, John Wesley could be found ministering to the lonely, being outspoken in his opposition to slavery, advocating for prison reform, and seeking to make health care available to the poor. So friends, even in England, in the 18th century, God saw, God heard, God knew, God came, and God led to something new. Now Wesley set a precedent for those who would follow in this discipline for centuries to come. And as communities of Methodist expressions formed across America, they would amplify the voices of the oppressed and work to make changes in the systems that was holding them down, all while caring for individual needs at the same time. In fact, in 1908, the Methodist Episcopal Church added their voice to that labor movement and wrote a social creed that called for the end of child labor, a fair wage, and safety standards. And this justice work continues even today as we work for systemic and political change through the United Methodist Board of Church and Society. Moses' encounter with this mysterious bush allows us to be reintroduced to who our God is. Because the truth is that today we may feel like our world is on fire and that we're heading for our own destruction. We may find our voices along with those who are crying out, asking for God to intervene. But perhaps some of us are wondering if we're going unnoticed. So I want you to hear God speak to you today. I am your God. I have observed your misery. I have heard your cry. I know your suffering. I have come to deliver you. I am with you. It's with this assurance that I pray we go into our Labor Day embodying Moses by continuing this work of confronting today's Pharaohs, of lifting up the lowly, and demanding justice for all. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we look for those burning bush moments in our own lives and the ways in which God is speaking to us and revealing God's grace to us, we come to the table and here we find God's grace offered freely to us. So as we ready our hearts for the celebration of Holy Communion, receive this invitation to join in Christ's feast of fellowship and renewal. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. So therefore, let us confess our sin to God and to one another. If you'd please join me in the prayer of confession. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart, we have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. 
we have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I invite you into a time of silent and personal reflection. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Now, as the forgiven people of God, let us pray together the great thanksgiving, and we'll use the sung responses on pages 17 and 18. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. O Lord, you formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life, and when we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, he fed the hungry, and he ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. And on that night in which you gave, he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, and he blessed it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then when the supper was over, he took the cup. And again, he gave thanks to you, and he gave it, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice, in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, and on these gifts of the bread and the cup, that they may be for us the body and blood of Christ, and we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever.
because we receive from one loaf. We who are many are made one body in Christ. That body was broken for us, that we may be made whole. And this cup is a cup of our salvation. It's a cup of God's grace poured out for you and for all, that we might realize that we are loved, that we might experience healing, that we might find God's grace waiting for us. This time I'd like to invite those who are helping to serve this morning to come forward. And as they're coming forward, uh, just a reminder that we will be serving by intinction today. Uh, We'll give you a piece of bread, and then you'll dip it into the juice and take both elements together. And this table is not a table that belongs to Oak Hill United Methodist Church. This table is not one that belongs to the United Methodist Church. This is the Lord's table, and all who desire to get close to God and to receive God's grace are welcome to come and fellowship with us. So please know that you are welcome. Please know that you can find what you are looking for here at this table. The table has been set. The feast has been prepared. You're welcome. So please come and receive.
joins us here. He breaks the bread. The Lord who pours the cup is risen from the dead. The one we love the most is now our gracious host. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share. Let us go to God once more in prayer as we give thanks for the, the grace that we have received at Christ's table. If you'd please join me in the prayer after receiving. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As we get ready to sing our closing hymn, if Oak Hill feels like a place that you'd like to call home, we would like to officially welcome you into this family of faith. And you can either come and talk to Pastor Missy or myself uh, as we sing or after the service um, as we exit into the courtyard. Um, and we'd love to tell you more about the church and how you can be a part of it. All right, now if you'd please stand as you are able, let us join together in singing for everyone born. The words will be on the screen. Let's get you connected with what's happening in the life of the church. And as we look for where and how, here are a few things coming up that you should know about. 
Um, Vicki Matusik is out at her connection station, and Missy is right up here. If y'all can, um, if y'all can come on up. Yeah, here comes Vicki. She's coming. All right. Well, our youth are excited about, uh, to share about their mission trip experiences from this summer, as well as what they're looking forward to in 2024. And if you join us next week in worship, you can come and hear all about it. We've got another listening room coming up in just a couple weeks, and our featured artist is uh, Malford Milligan. So join us for some great music on Friday, September 15th. And for more information, just find Vicki uh, at her post at the Connection Station. All right. Yeah, she'll tell you all about it. And then parents of young children, there's a new class getting ready to start called Parenting for Faith. And it's going to meet during Sunday, the Sunday school hour beginning next week. And Pastor Missy is going to lead it, so come check it out. And for those looking for spiritual direction, we have another class that's just starting that will uh, meet us on Thursday morning, meet on Thursday mornings and evenings. Um, it's a spiritual direction class, so aptly named. Um, and if you like more information about either class, uh, Pastor Missy can share that with you. All right, well, as we get ready to leave this place, I invite you to join in this responsive benediction. Words are going to be on the screen. Today is the day. God embraces all hues of humanity, delights in diversity and difference, favors solidarity, transforming strangers into friends. And so shall we. Today is the day. God cries with the masses of starving people, despises growing disparity between rich and poor, demands justice for workers in the marketplace. And so shall we. Today is a day. God deplores violence in our homes and streets, rebukes the world's warring madness, humbles the powerful, and lifts up the lowly. And so shall we. Today is a day. God calls for nations and peoples to live in peace, celebrates where justice and mercy embrace, exults when the wolf grazes with the lamb. And so shall we. Today is the day God brings good news to the poor, proclaims release to the captives, gives sight to the blind, and sets the oppressed free. And so shall we. Go in peace. Amen. Thank you.